cash with bottles of water that's underneath the wolf pit. Um, as you turn to John chapter 2, I ask you to pray for me this morning. I had a thought that I was going to be preaching from. I, the Lord, I thought the Lord had gave it to me. I even told Jamie Taylor the name of it Friday while we was riding. And uh, when he was riding one way, I was riding another, and we was talking. And, but the Lord has changed it on me today. And uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand with me in the honor of God's Word. If you're in John chapter, if you can stand, if you can't, God understands that, and we understand it also. But we stand in reverence of His Word and the inerrancy and the power and the truth that it contains. Uh, and uh, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 23, and we'll read out through the rest of the chapter. Uh, but it's good to have my wife on too uh, today. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now when the past, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of men, for he knew what was in man. Let's read again. Verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. If I had a title for this morning's message, it would be, Glamour shot or genuine? Glamour shot or genuine? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in Jesus' name, I come to you this morning and I do thank you for this day. We've already come before you. We've asked you to bless us with your presence. Lord, we've lifted up songs about you and to you. And God, I pray that we have lifted them up with a heart that meant the things that we said. Heavenly Father, Lord, we take so for granted what a privilege it is to be called a child of God. To be able to come and to lift up and to sing songs unto you as we're reminded of what went up in Carolina, Lord. The man coming in there and, Lord, just killing others because they were in a church. Lord, we lift up them today. But God, right now is this Father's Day. I pray that, Father, you will be glorified in this service. And that Spirit, you will breathe life into this service. And God, that we will hear what we need to hear and we will act the way we need to act and respond in the right fashion. And God, that today our lives will be changed for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in His name I pray. Amen. How many of you remember Glamour Shots? You remember them? And know how they did it, huh? Wasn't that what they looked like? Well, let me, well, well that more like this right here, wasn't it? Little blue font hair. My wife and her sisters. <laughs> Can I tell? You've been gone for a week, baby. My wife and her sisters. You remember nineties was just the it. Big hair, a lot of makeup, all that. Glamour shots. They make you look soft. Real pretty. My wife and her sisters, they couldn't afford them, so they did their own. They would make each other up and take pictures. I'll bring some tonight, let you see them. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about a glamour shot is this it is a lie. Ain't nobody looks like they look in a glamour shot. They are so touched up. Some of us is so ugly that if they tried to blur it up and all that, all you'd see would be like one of them identities they tried to hide on TV. They have to fluff us up that much, but but they change your looks and they change it, and you just look so beautiful. I and mean, then if you lay a picture of an average person uh, beside their glamour shot, you would say, "Is this you? How long ago has this been?" And you may not even recognize the individual. 
Because see, glamour shots are fake. They're not the individual. They are maybe what the individual wants to look like, would rather they look like, and it helps self-esteem, but all of it's just paint, fancy clothes. A lot of some of even the things wasn't even real clothes. They just sat around your neck or put it around your neck. And the jewelry was fake. There's nothing there. There was nothing substantial there. And this morning, as I've studied this week, I and I told you this last week, one of the biggest concerns that I have is for church-going people that are going to die and go to hell. They can say the words, justification, sanctification, all these different, they can say all that stuff. They can tell you the right things. They've been baptized. They've had their names wrote down on the roll. But there's going to be a day when the Lord looks at them in the face and says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because I never knew you. Glamour shot, or genuine, maybe it should be called a glory shot, or genuine. This passage I read this morning, to be honest with you, I've been listening to John MacArthur and Bodie Bachman this week on the radio, beginning of the week, and, and one of the sermons I listened to that was called a sissified and weak Jesus. And it talks about how culture has made Jesus into this thing that, oh, what will I do without you? I love you so much. And I'm here. And He is waiting for you. Don't get me wrong. But Jesus don't need us. You know that? I mean, and Jesus was a man's man. He was a man. He had rough hands. He was a carpenter. And this passage right here, you can begin in verse 13 of chapter 2 and, and also over in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19. You look in these, you see one time where Jesus really bowed up and showed His strength. He comes into the city at the time of the Passover into Jerusalem, the place you would expect Him to be, expect, uh, to be accepted. It is the king's city. He is the king. He marches in there, but you know He was rejected and worse in Jerusalem than He was in anywhere else. There's a place of rejection to Him. But he, he goes up there and He gets to the place, the temple, His Father's house. And as He goes to the temple, instead of finding them, treating it as a Father's house and as a place of prayer, they are treating it as a mall or as a shop. Center. They're taking Roman denarii and changing it from that kind into the temple uh, tokens or the temple money and probably charging them an ungodly amount to change it from Roman into Jewish. And when he goes in there and he sees the beasts that are in the, uh, the area and he sees the ox and the sheep and the birds and all that that's in there, he gets angry. And praise God, it's a godly anger that he has. And right here in the book of John, you see something that you don't see anywhere else in it. It says that he takes time to bring a will. That he deliberately, in, and the good thing is, is that he, he, he's able to control his anger, but he sits down, and I don't know if he sits, but I can kind of see him as he walks in there and he's talking to the Father, and he takes it and he begins to pray. See, weapons were not allowed with inside the temple gates. But a whip was for animals. And he looks up and he says, Get out of my father's house. He takes the money changers' tables and he puts the money changers' tables and he whips the beast to get them out. And I wondered, maybe he laid a lick, probably he laid a lick on some of the uh, cattle rusters or whatever they'd have been in there. He tells those that have the birds, get your birds out of here too. He says, because my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you have treated it unholy and ungodly. And then what happens is, is the Jewish leaders, those that were in charge of how things were running there, basically they had up in Jesus and they look at Him and it doesn't say this, but I could about hear it in their voices. They'd be like, how dare you? Who gives you the right? Where do you get the authority? 
Basically, they say, show us a sign. If, if, if you have the authority, show us a sign. Jesus says, tear down the temple, and in three days I'll build it back up. Then completely shoots over their heads, and I wonder how many times Jesus speaks to us, and it goes straight over our heads, even though we might think we know it all, and we are such spiritually inclined people. They look at him and say, man, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you think if we take you... Tear it down, you can rebuild it in three days. They didn't understand. He was talking about the literal body of Jesus. It was the body of the Heavenly Father in which the Spirit of Heaven dwelled. Amen. And he basically told them, Well, he may not have said it, but he, I ain't showing them. It'd be a waste. It'd be like casting pearls before swine for me to do a miracle in front of you. And that's what I wanted to preach this morning. But I ain't going to preach that. Because it leads into a passage right here that really caught my attention as I began to read. It says that basically after Jesus, it's the same time, but it says specifically on the feast day, which must have been the Passover day. Jesus took this time, all these people were there in Jerusalem, and it was His duty to sow the seed as we talked about last week. And he, anytime He had the opportunity, He sowed the, sowed the seed. And while He was out there, He began to do some type of miracles. And, and uh, I, I, even though it said he didn't do the miracle there earlier when they called on him to do it, it does seem there in verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. And we don't know what those miracles are, but John chapter 21 verse 25 tells us, And there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Jesus did so many miracles. We only have a small portion of what Jesus did uh, as He was on His ministry for those three years. But Jesus began to do a great work and He began to do a great thing during that time. And notice what it says. It says that many believed in His name. The word there, uh, believed in the Greek, is pisteo. Pisteo. And the word means to think to be true, but, or to, it implies that they trusted in Him, or they committed themselves unto Him. We would call it getting saved. That they began to watch what Jesus was doing, and as they watched it, they thought, who He was and the things that He were doing were to be true and outwardly they gave themselves over to Him or they committed their lives over to Him. Can I tell you this? That it was undeniable that Jesus had power. Think about it. Over in the book of John chapter 6 verses 5 through 15 where Jesus took five loaves and two fishes and He blessed it and He broke it and He fed 5,000 men, just men, from two Two uh, fishes and five loaves. It was undeniable that a miracle had been worked at that time, Brother Grady. And the same thing was true here at this time, where they were at, as He was working miracles in Jerusalem and they were seeing these signs. It was undeniable. They couldn't deny that there was a power in their midst. They saw Jesus. They saw the work that He was doing and they, with their own eyes and they felt it in His presence and they could not say there is no power there. Because they had come into the presence of the Almighty. Into the presence of God Himself. And I'm going to tell you this. When you come into the presence of the power of God, you cannot deny the fact that something is real, something is powerful, something happens in the name of Jesus. I got to thinking about this this morning and this week. You know there are marriages that have been falling apart and breaking up and in the eyes of the world and in the way that the world would put it, the marriage should have fallen apart. But Jesus, they've given their life and their home over to Jesus Christ. And when the world looks on it, they may not know the name of Jesus. They may not be able to say what happened. But all they know is something happened. Powerful came inside that marriage and it should have fell apart. But in Jesus' name, it is still together. You see, it is undeniable. When God keeps a marriage and a home together, sicknesses are healed. I'm thinking about Brother Eric right now. And I still believe Brother Eric is going to walk back through this door one day and be able to sit in this pew 
and to tell us what's going on but what, uh, in his life and give his testimony. But there are many times and many uh, uh, situations where whether it be through medicine or whether it just be through the power of the moving of the Holy Spirit that people have been given up for death. They have been turned over to a specific kind of disease. They have been told they have this type of cancer. But in a few months, the doctors will come back and they'll say, oh, we must have misread the thing. Or, or the cancer, we went in there and we got it all and all that. That is a miracle. It's undeniable that God has given us the wisdom and the power of His Holy Spirit that there are healings that go on in our world. Amen. There are healings that go on in our world. Um, I got to thinking about this. When a sinner is saved, I'm going to tell you what, when somebody like me that had the lifestyle that I had meets Jesus Christ and though it takes a while for them to get where He needs to be or where they ought to be, or maybe it's at a snap of a finger where an addict is removed and there is no longer an addiction there, it's undeniable that something moved in their life and their life was changed completely. And I'll tell you something else. You can't sit under the anointed preaching of God from an anointed man preaching from an anointed book and deny that there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will encourage you, it will uplift you, and it will convict you because that is what it's intended to do. You may not understand what it's doing, but praise God, it does something. Why? Because there is power in the presence of God. And it is undeniable. It is undeniable. That's the way it is. At this situation where they were at at this time. Jesus was in pain. He was working. He was moving. And the Bible says that they began to commit themselves. But they began to believe on His name. That's awesome, isn't it? I got to think about what would that be in your life if it was at Yomans Chapel. If many believed on His name at Yomans Chapel. I'll tell you what, I'd get excited. I tell you, I, I, I'd probably run ahead of God and say, we need to start doing this, we need to start doing that, we need to get into the class, we need to get this and that. You know, if those people that were there that day began to walk down the aisle, I would get out the Bible and I'd sit down with them and I'd go through the Scriptures with them to make sure they knew that it wasn't the preaching, it wasn't the baptism, but it was faith in Jesus Christ that brought salvation. If they walked out of Yom Shepherd today after I went through it and I felt like they understood and had a grasp of what the Scripture says, I'd push them to baptism. I'd take them over to where Jesus Christ Himself was baptized and we got a book, we got a sheet of paper why I'd be baptized with a Bible back so, uh, uh, submersion by uh, baptism and I'd push them to be baptized because that's the first act of obedience after salvation. It's not a bringer of grace but it is a declaration of grace in Jesus Christ. And then you know what? I urge them to be a member of the church. Preferably this one, but if not, somewhere. Second best is better than nothing, I reckon. Amen? <laughs> and then I'd bring them before the church and maybe with a tear in my eye, I'd say, I present to you a new believer that wants to be. And with a clear heart and a clear conscience, I'd say, I believe we ought to accept them on as a member of Yeoman Shepherd Baptist Church. And then I'd seek to get them involved. I may not call them every day, but I'd try to leave them up with somebody. Somebody to talk to. Ask Jamie Taylor, I'll sick a hound dog on you one of Jamie. They'll run you down. I may not, but I'll have people running after you. <laughs> to get them to know the Word. And then as time goes by, I want to put them in a position somewhere. Get them working. If they've proven themselves faithful, I'll put them in the Word. And that goes on. All over the place. But I want you to notice something. This is what really stood out to me in verse 22 or 24. That these people came to commit themselves, or they came to give themselves over to Jesus. But look in verse 24. It says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Jesus did not commit himself. Under them. You want to know something neat? You remember that word up there in verse 23 where it said believe or in the Greek pisteo which means to think to be true or implying to be true or to make a commitment to? Right there that word where Jesus said He did not commit Himself is the same word in the Greek. 
This passage is saying where they wanted to place their trust in Jesus and to put a commitment in Him that at the same time, while Jesus was looking back at them, He refused to put His trust in them. He refused to put His faith in them. See, they would have told you I had an encounter with Jesus. He was doing a work. He was moving through town and doing great things. And you know what? I got the tingling up inside of me and I told Jesus I believed in Him. But yet if they'd have died that day and stood before the throne, Jesus would have looked them in their eyes and He would have said, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They never got saved. They were never born again. At least not in this moment. Why do you say that, Brian? Because salvation is not my choice nor your choice. It is His choice. And He is the one that brings the salvation. We just hope to God that He will accept us into His kingdom. Many people preach today that all you got to do is when you get good and ready for it, you come up here, you pray a prayer, say these magic words and get done. No, you get saved when God says you get saved. You get saved when He draws you. It is by His Spirit and by His name and by His name alone He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. You don't do it on your own, won't you? You don't do it on your own time and you don't do it your own way. You do it when Jesus is the initiator of it. Jesus did not have confidence in these people. He does not credit their faith. This puts an end to any, any easy believism. You say, Brian, well, what happened here? I will tell you, the same thing happened here that happens in many of people's lives today. They get a glamour shot or a glory shot. They come into the presence of God and they see that something's real and they see that something happening and they may have some type of faith but they ain't got a saving faith. There is something wrong with their belief system. Jesus knows the hearts and minds. Listen to what it says. The Bible says and Jesus says it right here that He knew them or because He knew all men. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 it says, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Listen to these quotes from the Gospel. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 4 it says, And Jesus knowing their thoughts saith, Wherefore thank ye evil in your hearts. Mark chapter 12 verse 15, Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, meaning Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why give ye me? Luke chapter 5 verse 22, But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, He answered, saying unto them, Why reason ye in your hearts? You see this, that when Jesus was on this earth, He was 100% man, but He was also 100% God. And God knows the beginning from the end. He is eternal. Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew whether their faith was a real faith, whether it was a passing thing, whether they would come a day, whether they would want to give it back, or whether they would be ashamed of that they have got saved. And let me tell you, he ain't going to put his precious gift into somebody that he knows from the beginning will not receive it with a trip and a loving faith. Listen, Jesus right now knows if we're mad at him. We can act so pious and we can act outward like everything's good to go, but many times in the world we live in, we get upset with God because we don't understand what's going on around us and we know that He is the ultimate authority and power and whether we want to or not, we question and get a little resentful about the situation we find ourselves in. Can I tell you this morning, go ahead and admit it. Tell it, deal with it, and move on past that situation. You know, Jesus knows today whether we're trusting Him. David said, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Why? Because David could fool himself, but he couldn't fool God. He knows if we're in a time of weakness, we can pull our chest up and be big and outward all that, but Jesus knows that inside we're weeping like a little baby. And He knows that the day we made a profession of faith, whether it was a real, genuine Jesus, I'm on board for the rest of my life. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I surrender who I am and I receive who you are and that's what my life is going to be about or He knows whether it's just something to get me out of the situation I'm in. He knows whether it's just the 
get out of hell free card. He knows whether it was just a genie in the bottle, make everything all right, keep me out of trouble. I'm sorry I got caught, salvation. He knows whether it was just an emotional and mental moving commitment or was it a surrender of total identity over to Him. See, from the outside looking in, we would have said they got saved. We would have let them join the church and we'd have let them do what they wanted to do. So what was the problem here? They said they believed. What was the problem here? It may have been some type of faith, but it was not a saving faith. This is what it says in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, oh, excuse me, that's the wrong verse. That's the wrong verse. Let me find it. He said, Jesus answered in John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat loaves and fishes. See, they were following Jesus around. There were multitudes, Brother Joy, going with him, going to places he would, and all that. But the only reason they wasn't following him because he was the Son of God or because he had power to save them from their sins, they had made Jesus about them. Yep. They had made his ministry not about the glorification of the Father, but about their fat bellies. And many people today, even preachers in the pulpit, make salvation about you. Make salvation about me. You don't want to go to hell? Get saved. And praise God. If you get saved, you won't go to hell. But can I tell you this? Jesus came to die for us, but He did it because He wanted to glorify the Father. And that's what salvation is. Yes, when we come to Him, we come to Him because we need a Savior. But we recognize the love that He has for us and how good He is and how He poured out His mercy for us. And at the beginning, it might look like it's about just our not dying and going to hell. But the deeper you get into a relationship with God, you're going to begin to understand that whether you go to heaven or you go to hell, He is still God. He is still worthy of praise. He is still high and lifted up. And we are blessed in the name of the Lord just to be able to say his name, much less be called his child. Amen. You see, these men and these women would say, there's people today, they, they know there's more to being a Christian. You know there's more power. And you want to see that power in your life. Can I ask you today, has Jesus committed himself unto you? The only way he commits himself unto you is when you commit yourself wholly unto him. He is not a wasteful God. These people were at this place. They had an encounter with Jesus. They said, I believe in Jesus. But Jesus, knowing the truth about the whole situation, would not commit Himself unto Him. And you know what? If you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. And I believe there's people today that have walked the aisle. They've prayed prayers. They've went through the motions. But do you know that you're saved? Do you know that Jesus lives within your heart? You see, it's not about how much you go to church and all that stuff. It's about an inward change. See, he goes on down into chapter 3 and meets a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus comes to him by night. And he said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, this is when we got the best verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But He looks at him and He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You need my Spirit to come and live inside you and make you fresh and new. See, it's a change from the inside out. It's not just the words you say. It's not just something you do. But it is a new life. It is a transforming thing. See, a lot of people, I believe, have gotten glory shots. 
a moment where they felt something. They had a move, but that's not the reality. The reality is a lot of people are lost tonight and going to hell. You said, Brian, how you say that? Because our world and our church and our community would be in a whole lot different shape if we were all saved. Amen. If we were all saved. Oh, but I'm going to tell you this too. Some of us can wander so far away from God that we begin to question whether we were ever really saved or not. Uh -huh. But I'm going to tell you this. When Jesus commits Himself unto you, He commits Himself unto you. You can't get rid of Him then. You can't get rid of Him. You know how I know? Well, one reason how I know is Peter tried to. Peter tried to. He flat out denied and said, I don't want Him. I don't want Him. I don't know Him. Didn't he? But before that happened in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, and the Lord said, Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the bread. Oh, praise God. And you can tell you how else I know? Because I was there too. I tried. Did my best to throw what he had given me away. But he was there. Oh, but in those dark times and in those dark hours, you wonder what they ever really saved. Was I ever really saved? Oh, but in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, we're told by the apostle. He says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So you don't have to wonder about it today. You can come and be saved. See, when Jesus moves into your life, there is true abiding evidence of salvation. There is. There is. There may be dips and valleys from time to time, but you ain't going to slip away. And I believe this, he'll take you out of this world just like he did um, uh, Samson. And like it says over in the book of 1 Corinthians, he'll destroy the body to save the soul. You wander far enough away. But I want you to look at it. Jesus, when you get saved, Jesus commits himself unto you. It means he comes and he sets himself up in your life. Look at your life right now. Is there evidence of Jesus in your life? Is He doing the work? See, the same Spirit that lived inside of Jesus and resurrected Jesus is what moves into us on the day that we get saved. And that is a powerful Spirit. And it's a living Spirit. And we might be able to dampen Him for a little while, but sooner or later He's going to pop up like a roaring lion and He's going to live through us. He's going to live through them. You see, there's coming a day that we'll stand before God. We'll stand before God. Now, in verse 25, got me thinking about this in chapter John chapter 2, and this is in closing. It says, And needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in him. Jesus basically said he didn't nobody, he didn't need nobody to come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And, and Amy loves you, and Pamela loves you, and Dad loves you, and all that. He don't need all that. Because he's looking inside of us right now. When we're out there being as sorry as sorry can be, or when we're being the best, the best we can be, he still knows the motive and the reality that's in our heart. And we can stand before the Lord one day, and we're going to say, well, I did this, and I did that, and I did I did it alongside of Amy, or I did it alongside of Brother Robert Bennett. I did this. And basically Jesus be like, I don't need to know all that. Because I already know your heart. And he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because I know, I know, man. Think about the most precious gift that you have right now. Precious gift. Would you put it in somebody's hands who wouldn't take care of it? Why, heck no. And you know what? I ain't deserving to hold the most precious gift that the Father has to offer. But He has placed it inside of my heart. And I'm a watchman over it so that He can work through me. The precious blood and the precious spirit, innocence of spirit and blood is living inside of me. And it's my duty to watch over that and to take care of it the best I can. Amen. And that's what it is today with you. So the question is today, if you've had that encounter with Jesus, 
You've had that move. You've been in a place where you got the tinglings and all that. You've walked the aisle. You've prayed the prayer. In that moment, let's, let's go back to that moment right then. And you, you said, Lord, I commit myself to you. From that point on to where we're at right now, can you look at your life and say, I can tell Jesus committed himself to me. I can tell. Because it ain't nothing like it used to be. Or do you look back at that time and you, you say, I committed myself to you, but there's been a time or two when things were a little bit different, but you know you're basically the routine. It's been pretty much the same. I still think the same way. Still like the same thing. Still can do them without much heartache. See, the invitation is today. Was it genuine? Or was it a glamour shot? Just a moment in time. The devil took a picture to make you think everything was all right. Here's the invitation today. Simple one, just two parts. Come and nail it down. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised tonight's service. If you do not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved, you come right now and let me show you what the Bible says about salvation. Number two is this. If you know that Jesus lives inside of you, it's time to give thanks to God that Jesus has committed himself to such a worm as I. I am undeserving of his commitment. And he has never left me. He has never let me down. And it's a good time to shout it out and tell him how good he is. As the pianist in our song director comes. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you.